Greetings, dear brothers and sisters, in the holy, mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Once again, the Messiah and Messiah alone be all the praise, honor, and glory. And today is the 21st day, right, Anna? Yes. Yeah, today is the 21st day of the fourth month of the year 2019. Today is the day we changed our lives forever. Today is the day when God's word was validated. Today is the day when we celebrate resurrection of Lord Jesus Christ. Today, I'm here, dear brothers and sisters, once again to help our nine-year-old daughter, Anna. She has a song for us, a resurrection song, which the Spirit of God led her to once again. So she has a song for us, and I believe the name of the song is You Are Alive. Right, Anna? Yes. Yeah, you are alive. Messiah is alive, dear brothers and sisters. That's the biggest discovery of our life, that the garden tomb is physically empty. But the question is, has the resurrection Sunday changed our Monday forever and ever? Has the resurrection Sunday, is it just an excitement? Or the resurrection Sunday, the empty garden tomb, empowers you and me every single day when we... In Luke's account, Luke chapter 24, I believe in verse 5, we see, let's take a real quick look. Luke chapter 24, verse 5 says, Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? Today are we seeking the living among the dead among the dead things of this world among the dead things of the flesh and the fleshly excitements or are we seeking the living thing which is lord jesus christ living by his power and dwelling in his word digging deeper and every single day getting to know him better dear brothers and sisters the question is did the resurrection someday change our monday that's the question today this res as we celebrate as we celebrate the resurrection sunday in 2019 the resurrection sunday the empty garden to let that question linger in our minds dear brothers and sisters in john accounts when we see when mary magdalene stood stood there let's take a real quick look at mary Mac mary magdalene was doing john chapter 20 let's pick it up around verse 11 there it says but mary stood outside by the tomb weeping she was lingering there she was lingering there dear brothers and sisters lingering there it's in our prayer closet is something which we all need to learn most of the times we go dump our list of needs and come back we don't linger there we don't linger there to let's see what god will have we don't linger there with the hard copy of our bible the 66 books spent by 40 different authors over a period of 15 1600 years giving us one supernatural message we don't linger there but mary mary of magdalene here john records but mary stood outside by the tomb weeping and as she wept she stooped down and looked into the tomb and she saw two angels in white sitting one at the head and other at the feet where the body of jesus messiah had lain then they said to her woman why are you weeping she said to them because they have taken away my lord and i do not know where they have laid him now when she had said this she turned around and saw jesus standing there and did not know that it was jesus jesus said to her woman why are you weeping whom are you seeking she, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. And then at that moment, dear brothers and sisters, oftentimes we fail to realize that moment. We see Mary, helpless, totally devastated, going, seeing how Messiah was brutally slaughtered she is totally devastated and then she's crying and weeping and seeing her body his body messiah's body is not there and she's totally devastated at that moment she is just sulking but what happens what happens the hope against every hope comes back when 
when Mary hears Messiah calling out, Messiah calling out her name. Today is the day to wait on Messiah to hear calling out our name. Mary, as soon as it happened, what did Mary do? She turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say teacher. And Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father. And to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord. And that he had spoken these things to her. That's a staggering, staggering, staggering record, dear brothers and sisters, which John has for us in as much detail as possible. Today is the day we celebrate resurrection of Lord Jesus Christ. So today, let us once again invite the presence, invite the presence of God. Today, let us petition together. Lord, decrees me during this time as Anna sings for us as Lord has the message for us. Today, once again, let us yield to the Spirit of God so that we don't gratify our flesh, but Messiah once again can renew our minds and can strengthen us in the days that remain through his inerrant and infallible word. And let's once again bow our hearts and let's start with a word of prayer. Shall we, Anna? Yes. All right. Hallelujah. 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 We just praise you. We just praise you. We just praise you, Lord. We stagger. We stagger. We stagger today when we today once again. Once again, understand, understand that your word is validated. Your word is validated, Father, that the garden tomb is empty. The garden tomb is empty, Father. We just thank you, Lord, for all that you have done, you are doing and will be doing, Lord, through each one of us, through this earthen vessels, which is used for just garbage but you father through the precious blood of jesus christ of nazareth has transformed our life forever we just thank you father for who you are lord for being our lord for being our god for being our savior for being our messiah for being our all in all today as we come in your presence we thank you lord we thank you lord we thank you lord for calling each one of us by your grace and your grace alone and not by any merit of our own we thank you father for being an awesome father for being a good good father the father who we have been looking for all through our life we just thank you lord for being our God, our Savior, our all in all today as we come in your presence. We bring all our dear fellow brethren, all our dear brothers and sisters in your presence, Lord. And we pray, Lord, that please do pour out your spirit, Lord, on each one of us, on every single of our dear fellow brethren. Help them, Lord, once again to part their flesh and to yield to what you have, Lord. Strengthen them, empower them, Lord, in the days that remain, Lord. Once again, give each one of them, Lord, an unending hunger for your word and word in common. It, Lord, strengthen each one of us, empower us, Lord, so that you'll be glorified through every single breath of ours in these end of the end of the end moments today. I bring myself and Anna, Lord, in your presence once again and pray, Lord, that as we today, as Anna conveys your song, we convey your message to your appointed people, to all our dear fellow brethren, all our dear brothers and sisters today. We pray that we pray, Lord, please, please be our strength, Lord, in our weaknesses, Lord. We pray that we pray, Father, that we anoint every single alphabet which comes out of our mouths, Lord. Whatever is not from you, please let it not happen, Lord, through us once again, Lord. It is impossible, as Matthew 19, 26 tells us, but through you, Father, everything is possible. Everything is possible through you, Father. Today we surrender this time and every single cells of our body, Lord, we surrender unto thy mighty hands. And pray, Lord, we claim on Psalm 141, verse 3, and pray, Father, that today, please do set a guard over our mouths and keep watch over the door of our lips as we convey your message, Lord, to your appointed people. And once again, Father, at this moment, in the name of our coming and reigning King Yeshua HaMashiach, using our authority of Luke 10, 19, we bind every evil of the enemy which is coming at this time, coming at this video, coming at all our dear brothers and sisters, every single of our dear fellow brethren right this moment. And we pray for the hedge of protection for each one of us. Father, once again, we pray that may this message reach to your appointed people to accomplish thy mighty will, Lord. And also, Father, please, please do enlighten the hearts and minds of all our dear fellow brethren through 
through your Holy Spirit, Lord, and help them, Lord, to understand what you precisely have for each one of them through this message, through this time. May your name be glorified. Once again, we thank you, Father, and we commit ourselves, every single of our dear fellow brethren, into thy mighty hands without any reservation whatsoever in the name above every single name of our reigning king, our resurrected king, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen, amen. and amen and amen. So the song to the Anahaz, dear brothers and sisters, is you are alive, you are alive, and you can please go ahead, Anna. Lord Jesus, he is alive forever. He is mine and never will he leave my soul alone. Lord Jesus, he is my rock, my shelter, my strength and my song. Lord, you are the foundation cornerstone. You are alive, you won the victory. Once we were blind, and yet now we see. And Lord, you are alive. Death can no longer hold us, the giver of all life. Is you, Lord Jesus, and Lord, you are alive. Lord Jesus, he is alive. I'll praise him for the rest of my life, and I will live for you, oh my Lord. You are alive, you won the victory. Once we were blind, and yet now we see. And oh Lord, you are alive. Death can no longer hold us. The giver of all life is you, Lord Jesus. And oh Lord, you are alive. Lord Jesus, he is coming. And one day his face I will see all because he died and rose again. You are alive, you won the victory. Once we are blind, yet now we see. And Lord, you are alive. Death can no longer hold us. The giver of all life is you, Lord Jesus. Lord, you are alive. Death can no longer hold us. The giver of all life is you, Lord Jesus. Lord, you are alive. And you are coming back. Amen and amen and amen. He is risen, he is alive, and he is the God in tomb is empty, dear brothers and sisters. How crucial it is to understand today, dear brothers and sisters, how crucial it is to understand in our daily lives. What difference does it make? Is it just one day we go to church and just celebrate and go through the motion of the day and come back or does this empty garden tomb has a long lasting effect for every single day in our lives in the days that remain? That's a question, dear brothers and sisters, we need to ask. And we need to really dig deeper in the scriptures to find that. Because indeed, dear brothers and sisters, the truth is the biggest discovery of our life is that the garden tomb is empty. The garden tomb is empty. As a matter of fact, when we understand the crucifixion and resurrection of Lord Jesus Christ, that is the key, is the, is the key in the declaration of the gospel to the world, dear brothers and sisters. Today, we don't look at it 
we look at it perhaps and like a past event it's 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 a done deal it has happened today we don't really dwell in it today we don't really go through and understand through the scriptures what lord actually has underwent on our behalf only in the let, let's just take only these the last week of lord jesus christ leading up to the crucifixion leading up to the crucifixion and then of course the death burial and resurrection we don't take time dear brothers and sisters as a matter of fact i believe the gospel of john talks about it almost half the gospel of john is talking about the last week of messiah the last week of messiah it's so very crucial dear brothers and sisters because the longer we stay in this fallen world in this broken world in our fallen flesh the depravity our depravity which we don't want to acknowledge it catches up all these things just becomes mundane prosaic just becomes stale. it's like yes i know that yes i know that yes i know it's, yeah, i know it just becomes a head knowledge it just becomes a doctrinal thing but that's not what it is dear brothers and sisters we want to talk about the gospel as a doctrinal thing when we talk about the gospel as a doctrinal thing dear brothers and sisters then we are not really understanding in post the lord jesus christ in person what he has gone on our behalf dear brothers and sisters the crucifixion and resurrection of lord jesus christ there is no other event in history which has undergone such ridiculous historic reconstructionism it seems that every whatever so-called religious scholar or, or we call it scoffer however we want to call it as so-called religious scholars has an alternative narrative for this foundational doctrine of the Christian church. And this is probably because no other event in the history of mankind is as important to the Christian faith as the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Why is that? Not because we would not be able to appreciate the inside of his teaching without this event. Because many teachers, as a matter of fact, have said interesting things and have died for their beliefs. Not so that we can simply incorporate into our lives the motto of well, well, love your neighbor as yourself as important as that is. But that's not because it is so important the resurrection of Lord Jesus Christ. Because many leaders have given ma mankind lots of motives by which we can live. But the resurrection of Messiah sets Christianity apart from all other religious systems. Because many have died. But there is only one who resurrected according to all the specifications and all the prophecies which had been laid out centuries earlier. Many died, dear brothers and sisters, but there is only one. There is only one who rose. That's Lord Jesus Christ, our King, our Messiah. Yes, he lives and he lives forever. And because he lives, that's why you and me will live. No matter what you're going through today. Because he lives, we will live for eternity. Then there is a day coming when, dear brothers and sisters, we will hold hands together and see our risen king. And see our resurrected Messiah. The one who gave it all he had. And God raised him on the third day from death. Validating that we are not foolish. Do hallucinating here. Thinking things here. Because we walk by faith. We don't walk by evidence. We don't walk by sight. Science walks by sight. Scientists walk by sight. And yes, dear brothers and sisters, I was guilty of that before Messiah, Lord Jesus Christ, saved a wretch like me. But there is a day coming, dear brothers and sisters, when we will see our Lord Jesus Christ face to face. The resurrection of Messiah sets Christianity apart from all other world religious systems whatever they are as a matter of fact Apostle Paul made that very made that quite clear very clear when he explained to the Corinthian church I believe that's in first let's take a quick look first Corinthians chapter 15 verses 12 through 19 where Paul says it's first Corinthians chapter 15 verses 12 through 19 let's take a quick look at it and Paul says now if Christ has preached that he has been raised from the dead how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? 
But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty. And your faith is also empty. Yes. And we are found false witnesses of God. Because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he did not raise up. If in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pit pitiable. Dear brothers and sisters, that's something which is staggering, which we really, really want to pay attention to. Let's read that again, dear brothers and sisters. Paul says, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all the men most pitiable, dear brothers and sisters. That should tell us about all the different kinds of pros prosperity gospel and all the things. That tells us, dear brothers and sisters, without going into all that, that tells us, dear brothers and sisters, that if this is the life we want Lord Jesus Christ, we come to Lord Jesus Christ so that all our problems will be sorted out right this moment. Everything will get better. We will get materialistic benefits and, and things alike, dear brothers and sisters. Then we should let the Spirit of God open this scripture up for us that Paul says, In this life only we have hope in Christ. We are of all men the most pitiable, dear brothers and sisters. The best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. This is our worst. Sometimes we get it mixed up, dear brothers and sisters. We think that we need to have all the luxury and all the comfort. We get our necessities and wants mixed, dear brothers and sisters. And that's the time when we want to visit Romans 8 and 1 Corinthians chapter 15. These are the two chapters which will anchor our lives every time we read that. Every time we read that. There is no way, there is no way the enemy can oppress us anymore. Every time that's a staggering, staggering Romans chapter 8, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Every time you emerge victorious over whatsoever the battle is, whatsoever your, whatever attack you're going through valley or whatever insufficiencies or inadequacies it is. Romans chapter 8, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 indeed takes care of that when we let the spirit of god talk to us it's not about gratifying our flesh if, the, if in this life only we have open christ we are all we are of all men the most pitiable paul says as a matter of fact throughout the book of acts we see that the claim of the resurrection of lord jesus christ was the central historical fact of the early church evangelistic message when we see luke beginning the book of acts Luke begins his account of the church by stating in Acts chapter 1 verses 1 through 3. Luke, Luke says, records, the former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up. After he through the Holy Spirit had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he had, he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Let us, as a matter of fact, take a quick look. At the, for, at the first sermon of Peter, the birthday of church, the day of Pentecost. Let's pick it up in Acts chapter 2. Let's take a look at verses 22 through 24. What does Peter say? Uh, once again, the resurrection of Lord Jesus Christ. The resurrection of Lord Jesus Christ is the central thing. So Peter says, it's Acts chapter 2, dear brothers and sisters. We are picking, up, picking, picking it up around verse 24. Let's do from 22 through 24. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the 
pains of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it. And Peter, as a matter of fact, concludes his defense by saying in Acts 2.36, records that therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Both Lord and Christ. Dear brothers and sisters, the resurrection is the central and key phenomena both doctrinally and personally. In all spheres of our lives, it affects us how we look at it, how we let the power of re resurrection, excuse me, resurrection, let how the power of resurrection, we let that power govern our daily lives. Dear brothers and sisters, I believe in the book of Ephesians, there are two staggering prayers. Ephesians chapter 1, I believe, verses, and I'm telling this at the top of my head, so I may be a little off, but Ephesians chapter 1, I believe, verses 15 through 21. And then the next prayer is Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 21, where Paul, as a matter of fact, talks about four dimensions in that prayer in Ephesians chapter 3. But the point here is the two staggering prayers, dear brothers and sisters, if the Lord leads you, please do revisit that. It's staggering, staggering, staggering prayer. Ephesians chapter 1, I believe, verses 15 through 21. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. But in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 20, I believe, verses 20, 20 and 21, around that, we realize that Lord Jesus Christ, as true born-again believers, Lord Jesus Christ has given every true born-again believer the same power which resurrected Lord Jesus Christ from death. Can you imagine, can we imagine, dear brothers and sisters, what it means? We have the same resurrection power which Lord has given us, which resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. We, our human minds can't even fathom, dear brothers and sisters. It's something which we can never understand, but that power is with us. Are we being empowered with that power every single day? That's the question. Dear brothers and sisters, the resurrection of Lord Jesus Christ is the central theme of the crucifixion and resurrection. Death, burial and resurrection of Messiah of Lord Jesus Christ is the central theme of Christianity. Throughout the book of Acts, which is basically the manual of evangelism for each one of us. Dear brothers and sisters, each one of us who has called upon the name of the Lord. Now we have a mandate, Matthew, our great commission, Matthew 20, 28, 19 and 20. That we have a mandate to take the gospel all around to make disciples. To make disciples. So throughout the book of Acts, our, that's in our manual for evangelism is the book of Acts. Throughout the book of Acts, we see that the resurrection of Lord Jesus Christ was the center of their evangelistic message. In Acts 3.15, we see Peter after the healing of the lame man. In Acts 4.10, we see Peter before the Jewish... Sanhedrin talking about the resurrection of Lord Jesus Christ Acts 433 the general testimony of the church in Jerusalem in Acts 1040 when Peter's sermon before the house of Cornelius in Acts 13 verses 30 through 34 Paul's sermon in the synagogue synagogue in Antioch in Pisidia Acts 17 18 when Paul is preaching in the streets of Athens in Acts 17 31 where on the Mars Hill where Paul before the philosophers on Areopagus Everywhere we see, dear brothers and sisters, that the resurrection of Lord Jesus Christ is the key and central thing. Truly, truly the message of resurrection of Lord Jesus Christ is essential in preaching the gospel to the unconverted, to the not true born again and to the unconverted, to the secular world. But yes, dear brothers and sisters, that's not it. Oh, it because there's more. It is also the undeniable fulfillment of Messianic prophecy. Messiah said in Luke 9, 22, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. The resurrection, dear brothers and sisters, as a matter of fact, is also a key foundational doctrine upon which our faith as true born again believers is built when we see in Romans chapter 4 verses 22 through 24. Paul talks about the promise of the imputed righteousness. 
When Romans chapter 6 verses 4 through 11, when Paul talks about the promise of a new life in Christ, it's all based upon the resurrection of Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 8, 11, where Paul talks about the promise of life to our mortal bodies. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 14, when Paul promises the promise to be raised up with Lord Jesus Christ. In Ephesians 2, 6, the promise to sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And not only Paul, Peter tells us 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 3 through 5, promise of a living hope. 1 Peter 2, 21, promise to provide a solid foundation for our faith in God. All through we see, dear brothers and sisters, that resurrection is the key and central theme of Christianity of a true born again believer, doctrinally as well as home in our homiletic, homiletic application in our personal life. Every day to day it empowers us. As a matter of fact, dear brothers and sisters, when we see the 15th chapter, 15th chapter in 1 Corinthians, it, it is the longest chapter, I believe, in, in that epistle, 1 Corinthians, 15th chapter. It deals with the ultimate enemy of mankind, death. It announces the death of death itself. As a matter of fact, this chapter is regarded by many good scholars, by many good scholars, and that this is the centerpiece of Christianity. And the climax of Paul's message, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if the Lord leads you, dear brothers and sisters, please do go for it, staggering, staggering. It will be amazingly rewarding anytime, dear brothers and sisters, you're going through those valleys, anytime, Romans chapter 8, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, you will, you cannot, you cannot afford to after reading it and through in spirit and in truth, the spirit of God will lift you up. You will emerge victorious every time. Please try it out, dear brothers and sisters. Please do this. Perform the supernatural experiment in your natural prayer closet, dear brothers and sisters. The garden tomb is empty. God is alive. Messiah is alive. As a matter of fact, the dream of immortality begins in the oldest book of the Bible. Where Job says... For I know in Job chapter 19 verses 25 through 27, Job says, For I know, for I know that my Redeemer lives and he shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself and my eyes shall behold and not another. How my heart yearns within me. Staggering, staggering, staggering. So that brings us to the key factor, dear brothers and sisters, that what is the gospel? Today we hear gospel. What is the gospel? What is this gospel we are talking about? We see here somewhere telling good news and things, all that we hear. But what is this gospel? That's the key factor to understand. How, how do we preach this gospel, dear brothers and sisters, if we really don't understand what exactly the scripture tells us? And is it just our head knowledge or do I understand? Does it resonate in every single cell of my body from the crown of my head to the sole of my feet? This gospel, as a matter of fact, Paul defines this gospel for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 1 through 4. And we must first learn precisely what the gospel is. Let the Spirit of God talk to us. Open that up for us so that it resonates in every single cells of our body, in every single muscle fiber. So Paul says, let's take a quick look. That's the gospel. That's our foundation of every evangelism. That's the foundation of our call for the Great Commission, that's a foundation for a true born again believer. The gospel, the gospel of Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious gospel which has changed our lives forever. Let's real quick take a look what it is. First Corinthians chapter 15 verses 1 through 4. Paul says, moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received and which and in which you stand. By which also you are saved if you if if you hold fast that word which I preach to you unless you believed in vain, dear brothers and sisters. These first two verses itself we can spend at least a couple of hours and let the Spirit of God unfold for us today. Of course, we don't we are not getting there. We don't have the time. But and Paul continues 
in verse 3 for I delivered to you first of all that which I also received that Christ Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures that is the gospel Paul had already preached it Acts 13 Acts chapter 13 verse 30 Galatians 1 1 tells that after his Damascus conversion Peter and James as a matter of fact spent time with Paul in Jerusalem to fill in the details where Galatians chapter 1 verses 18 and 19 records that and after as a matter of fact the conversion after 14 years passed Paul returned to Jerusalem to conform with the apostles whether his preaching was in harmony with the gospel they proclaimed Galatians 2 1 tells us that so the three fundamental essentials of the gospel what is Paul telling us first of all Messiah died Messiah died this is first in importance of course not in chronology and here Messiah died Paul says what I for I deliver to you first of all that which I also received that Christ here it's not Jesus Paul says Christ Paul uses his official title of Messiah which is our goal the Hebrew word goal means kinsman redeemer and once again it's very crucial to understand as we read that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures Messiah did not just disappear the Romans soldiers just did not kill him or the Jews did not just plan and kill him it although it seems like that Messiah did not just disappear the authorities both Jewish and Roman made sure that his death was undeniable. The authorities outwitted themselves when they took so many precautions to make sure Messiah was dead and remained in the grave. Furthermore, Paul also says that it is according to the scriptures. It is according to the scriptures. So which is basically pointing once again to the Old Testament where we see Isaiah 53 clearly telling us Psalm 22 clearly telling us out of so many other places and that is once again cross-referenced in our New Testament Matthew 26 28 1 Peter 3 18 cross-reference Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22 dear brothers and sisters Messiah's death and resurrection was not an afterthought this was planned before the foundations of the world as a matter of fact it is even hidden in the Torah, in the first book of the Torah, as early as Genesis chapter 5, in the genealogy of Noah, the first 10 names from Adam to Noah, when we uh, try to find out the Hebrew, from the Hebrew root, the meanings that will be staggering, jaw-dropping to understand that God has had hidden the message of redemption there itself. Messiah's death and resurrection was never an afterthought. It was never. And Messiah just did not die. He died for our sins. Romans 5.8, Romans 8.32, Galatians 1.4, Ephesians 5.2, Titus 2.14, out of other places. I repeat, Messiah just did not die, but he died for our sins. Romans 5.8, Romans 8.32, Galatians 1.4, Ephesians 5.2, Titus 2.14, all tells us. And then we see this phrase, Christ died for our sins is, as a matter of fact, it's a doctrinal summary of the atonement. If we want to look at the doctrinal aspect, it's a doctrinal summary of the atonement as well. It gives us four points when it says Christ died for our sins. Number one, as our Christ died for our sins, the doctrinal statement of atonement. Number one, as a substitute, Christ died to appease God and meet the demands of the law. Romans 3, 25 and 26. Romans chapter 5 verses 9 through 19 tells us that. Number two, as our advocate, he effected reconciliation and made us righteous before God. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he who knew no sin was made sin. So that me and you can become the righteousness of God. 1 John chapter 2 verses 1 and 2 also tells us that Messiah is our advocate now. 
Point number three, as our mediator, he established a new covenant and accepted us as his own. Luke 22, 20, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 25 tells us that. And as our savior, he grants us eternal life through faith in him. John 3, 16. So the four, the doctrinal summary of the atonement as a substitute, as our advocate, as a mediator, as our savior. And then when we see the gospel, so that was Christ. The first point is Christ. Messiah, Lord Jesus Christ died and he just did not die. He died for our sins. According to the scriptures, it was nobody who killed him. It was a, he came with that mission. When we see Isaiah 9, 6, on, we see in our Christmas card, it says unto us a child is born. If we continue, it says unto us a son was given. Those are two different things. Unto us a child was born in Bethlehem, but unto us, dear brothers and sisters, when we go and dig deeper, we will know unto us a son was given. What does that mean? A father gave his son on Golgotha on Calvary. That's what it means, dear brothers and sisters. Once again, please, dear brothers and sisters, please do let us be active Berean, dear brothers and sisters. Once again, we are not here to sell our views. Let us be active Bereans. Acts 17, 11. Let us dig deeper in the scriptures. Let the spirit of God talk to us in these end moments. That's the most important thing. That's the most important thing. Let the spirit of God guide us. And the second point of the gospel is he was buried. So only as a matter of fact, Paul mentions the burial. As a matter of fact, only Paul mentions the burial. It points backward to the reality of death and forward to the character to the character of resurrection paul even as a matter of fact identifies the believers baptism with christ's burial in romans 6 4 colossians 2 12 as well so messiah's physical body dear brothers and sisters was placed in the tomb and on the third day a new glorified body came forth no longer subject to the time and space john 20 Verse 19, verse 26 tells us that. Luke 24, 31 tells us that. As a matter of fact, the important thing to understand in the gospel is the Greek passive voice here conveys the sense that God alone is the agent who creates life. He was raised on the third day. That's the third point, which is the resurrection here. He was raised on the third day. The passive voice here denotes the implied agent is God. Acts 3.15, Acts 4.10, Acts 5.30, Acts 10.40, Acts 13.30, Acts 13.37, all tells us about, explains that passive voice. The passive voice denotes the implied agent is God, that he was raised on the third day. As a matter of fact, the translations fail to exploit the differences in the Greek verb tenses between verses 3 and 4. The Greek uses the past tense to describe a single action in the past for Messiah's death and burial. But for the verb to be raised, that he was raised, the Greek has the perfect tense to indicate an action that occurred in the past but has lasting relevance for the present. And 1 Corinthians 15 is all about that. Verses 12 through 20, we go, it's all about that. That's what it talks about. So Messiah was raised from the dead and continues his life in the resurrected state as we understand from Revelation 5, 6. If the Roman or Jewish authorities, dear brothers and sisters, could have produced the body of Lord Jesus Christ, all the rumors would have quickly stopped and it, would, and it all would have ended. But they could not. The empty tomb emphasizes that Messiah's resurrection was Physical and it is emphasized in all four gospel Gospels that the body was missing Matthew chapter 28 verses 5 and 6 Mark chapter 16 verses 5 and 6 Luke chapter 24 verses 3 and 4 John chapter 20 verses 6 through 8 emphasizes the same thing that Messiah's Resurrection was physical Messiah's resurrection was physical the focus of the gospel once again, dear brothers and sisters, is on three principal things. Messiah's death for our sins, according to the scriptures. Messiah's burial and resurrection on the third day, according to the scriptures. And these overshadow all other aspects of his ministry. The, where, when we talk about the resurrection, dear brothers and sisters, there is something staggering going on, dear brothers and sisters. As a matter of fact, just trying to 
not getting into all doctrinal debates and these in these end moments all getting into strife and contention if we just spend time understanding the gospel it truly dear brothers and sisters it truly will edify us it truly will once again rejuvenate us it truly will once again we will know how great our messiah is to understand there is so much hidden dear brothers and sisters so many hidden gems are there in the scripture in every passage when they say that according to the scriptures messiah was resurrected on the third day what does that mean where in the scripture does it say where is it we of course talk about jonah jonah 117 says that as a matter of fact, Messiah in Matthew 16, 21, Messiah also taught that he would be killed and raised on the third day. So today we, before we end, we thought we'll mention, dear brothers and sisters, the three day examples and we will let you use this as a springboard. Please do pray over to dig deeper about these three day examples. What, what are the three, according to the scriptures, the three day examples one to start with. The third day of creation, which is Yom Slishi, the third day of creation, double blessing. The day of double blessing, Genesis chapter 1, verses 9 through 13, the day of double blessing. Then we see the Akedah, Akedah, where, which is the binding, which is Abraham's offering of Isaac, Genesis 22 and Hebrews 11, 19 tells us that. Then we see the third, once again, the type was is Joseph, Joseph interprets the two dreams in Genesis 40 verses 8 through 22. Joseph interprets the two dreams in Genesis chapter 40 verses 8 through 22 where the baker dies on the third day, the baker signifying the bread and then the cup bearer freed on the third day, the cup bearer once again signifying the wine. Isn't that staggering? Dear brothers and sisters, there is so much God has put for us in the scriptures. How much are we indeed digging? And dear brothers and sisters, once again, we don't need pastors and teachers and social media teachers. Let the personal tutor, the author himself, Ruach HaKadish, speak to our hearts. He will talk to us. He will. That's his job. John 16, 13 tells us that. The sanctification ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit now sanctifies us. How do we get sanctified? Father, sanctify them by your truth. Thy word is truth. John 17, 17. We are sanctified by his word. How does that happen? It's not just an academic or a scholarly reading. It's a reading when the word is active and living. It transforms our lives in a supernatural way, which nobody can explain, dear brothers and sisters. Then the fourth Typos we see is the crossing of the Red Sea. The third day after Passover departed from Mount Sinai. I believe that's Numbers chapter 10 verse 33 records that. We see the spies en route from Jericho. The story of Raham. Jo Joshua chapter 2 I believe verse 16 tells us. Then of course we know the example of Jonah and the great fish. Jonah 1 17. Then we see Esther fast for three days. Esther 4 16. And there are, as well as the New Testament, we see there are some of these typos of about three days. Dear brothers and sisters, we see the wedding in Cana in John, John 2, I believe it records, the wedding in Cana on the third day. Then we see Christ was in three days in the tomb, which of course Luke 24, 21 tells us. These are all the three days which the scripture talks about. Saul's blindness in Damascus, Acts 9, 9. Hosea. Records Israel's petition for Lord's return. I believe that's Hosea 5.15 through Hosea 6.3. Hosea 5.15 is the staggering, staggering, staggering scripture. Dear brothers and sisters, if the Lord leads you, please do take a look at it and let the Spirit of God unfold that for you. Dear brothers and sisters, today we are running out of time, but the point is once again, after his resurrection, Messiah's physical body could be touched. So Messiah's physical body had staggering properties. Why we are sharing this is these are the first John 3, 2 tells us that these are the same properties which we will be sharing. And let's take a look at it. Messiah's physical body could be touched. 
John 20, 27. It could be recognized, of course, with difficulty. John 20, verses 14 and 15. John 21, 4, 7. It could come and go through locked doors. Staggering power we'll have in millennium. Don't we, dear brothers and sisters? I'm sure that we all are looking forward to our glorified body. And that's nothing that we could own. We could do. It's a free gift which Messiah gives us. Isn't that staggering? And the empty garden too. Valid is that? And that empty garden too is going to empower us in the days that remain for us. Then we see also Messiah's resurrected body. He could eat and drink with them. Luke chapter 24 verses 42, 43, Acts 1, 4, Acts 10, 41 recalls that. Messiah's resurrected body was transformed to transcend time and space. 1 John 3, 2 tells us that. Dear brothers and sisters, these prophecies are just the beginning, of course. Just the beginning. Exodus, as a matter of fact, chapter 12 describes the Feast of Passover. Feast of Passover, it was set up as a type of Christ. One that gave the Jews, the Hebrews, an understanding of the use of a perfect lamb as a sacrifice. The blood of which would protect those under it from the wrath of God, the angel of death. The Jews were to prepare for the feast by removing all leaven from their homes. Symbolic of removing sin from their lives until they, they are doing that. This is the week we are going for the Passover. And Apostle Paul writes, as a matter of fact, in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Porge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Peter, Peter described how we are saved by the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spots. John the Baptist has a... As a matter of fact, also understood that Messiah was the fulfillment of the Levitical system of the blood sacrifice. I believe Le Leviticus chapters 8 and 9 talks about that. Messiah was the true spotless lamb. Dear brothers and sisters, Messiah was the true spotless lamb whose blood could take away the sins of the world. Our sins, our sin nature and every single sin of the world, every single sin of the world. Dear brothers and sisters, the sacrifice of bulls and goats could never take away sin as the writer of Hebrews noted in verse so verses 4 and 5 in Hebrews chapter 10, he quotes, the writer of Hebrews as a matter of fact quotes Psalm 40 verse 6. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and now offering thou wouldest, wouldest not. But a body hast thou prepared for me, dear brothers and sisters. The sacrifice of Lord Jesus Christ for the sins of humanity was not an afterthought of God. It was always a plan from the beginning. Today the empty garden too has empowered us for two things, dear brothers and sisters. Two things. Sin, the power of sin has been broken in our lives. And we can look forward to that glorified body, our eternal life. That's what, that's what the empty garden tomb, it empowers us throughout the law and prophets. God revealed his eternal plan of redemption to mankind. In advance, he described the sacrifice and resurrection of the Messiah. It was a plan he had purposed before he had even formed humanity. He then accomplished it. And through Lord Jesus Christ, we have the victory now and forever. The garden tomb is empty. Let us praise the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. The name above every single name of Yeshua HaMashiach. Death. Our final enemy, dear brothers and sisters, is defeated forever. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Death is defeated. The garden tomb is empty. Let the resurrection Sunday, let this resurrection Sunday, the empty garden tomb, empower your Monday. Empower the days that remain in your life to accomplish His purpose through you and in you. Today is the day to yield to Him. Today is the day to once again embrace the power. Embrace the power of the empty garden tomb. Today is the day. Now Isaiah 25, 8. Let's end with Isaiah 25, 8. The Lord says, Isaiah 25, 8. He will swallow up death in victory. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from of all faces. And the rebuke of His people shall He take away from from of all the earth, for the Lord hath 
spoken it. Praise God. Praise God. We thank you once again, dear brothers and sisters. Let us once again proclaim together that he is risen. He is alive. The garden tomb is empty. And let us once again be empowered. Not be excited for one or two days, but be empowered. Not fleshly excitement, but be empowered by the empty garden tomb for the days that remain to glorify Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, dear brothers and sisters, and let's end with a short word of prayer. Shall we, Anna? Yes. All right, you can please go ahead. Lord Jesus, once again, I bring ourselves in your presence, Lord. And I thank you, Lord, for this day and for every single thing you have done in our lives, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for dying for our sins and rising again, Lord. And bless us, Lord, as we go forth from here, and help us, Lord, to glorify you in everything we do, Lord. In the holy name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen and amen and amen. Thank you so much, Anna, once again. And thank you, dear brothers and sisters. Lord Jesus Christ is alive. He is risen. And the garden tomb is empty. Let's be and let's get empowered by the empty garden tomb. We thank you, dear brothers and sisters. And God bless each and every one of you. Shalom.